the pharmaceutical industry is very heavily driven by profit margins. It sounds like you're saying these companies are profiting from disease. Absolutely. There's yeah. no doubt about that. They benefit from disease. They benefit from having you hooked on the drug. If you cure someone, you've lost a customer for life. Women will lose interest if you're not that, that guy anymore. Inherently, a woman wants a man who's a man who's in his masculine frame. And a lot of these men aren't. They're out of shape, they lack leadership, they lack executive functioning. Every single thing that makes him a man, he lacks now. By the way, I'm giving you exclusives. This stuff no, nobody said before about, about dragons. I'm giving you the deep dive because we're in the city of the dragons, man. Instead of Netflix and chill and popcorn, spend at least one hour a day on a business. That one hour will compound and by three to six months, you'll see a huge difference in where you are. Let's tie our camel this year. We didn't have role models. Now we've got role models. It's only right we give back to the community. There's going to be a link where you can register your interest by putting your email address in. And once it's ready to launch, we'll notify you guys. Welcome to Tie Your Camel. All about grinding today for a better tomorrow. So if that's your kind of jam, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Today we've got a special guest, man. We've got Dr. Asif Munaf on the podcast. Welcome, brother. How you doing? Thank you, brother. Hey, good sound effects, <laughs> eh? Our first time, man. Something a lot different, isn't it? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the hospitality. I host that makes me coffee. I'll always, <laughs> always, always return back to Respect, bro. Man. Thanks for coming from Sheffield, man. Appreciate it, man. Um, one thing I want to ask you, bro, is that, you know what? You've been on a mad podcast run at the moment, right? And obviously by now, everybody knows, you know, you were featured on the BBC Dragon's Den, mm -hmm. the most recent candidate on The Apprentice, right? And you're all over social media, bro. You're all over my feed anyway, put it that way, yeah? So you strike me yeah. as a strategic person, someone that's purposeful. Mm -hmm. You don't do things like out of the blue, do you get me? Yeah. So I believe there's a mission, you got a mission, yeah? To spread the message. Of course, 100%. First question, bro. What's your mission? Right, the mission is to positively impact a million men before I die. Why? Because the reason why I say a million and the reason why I say a men, you have to have specific goals. The goal has to be specific. I believe in SMART. We had a SMART S in SM, you know, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time frame. Mm. So I've got the time frame there before yeah. I die. It's specific. It's men, and it's achievable because it's a million. I didn't say a billion men or ten billion men. In fact, there aren't even ten billion men in the world. So a million men before I die, positively, positively impact them with my message of positive masculinity, mindset, getting in shape, getting back on Dean recovering from setback and having post-traumatic growth. What inspired you to set that goal in the first place? Uh, as a doctor, we are trained to look after people, but it's very much one, per, one at a time, one person at a time, 10 minutes, lots, 15 minute appointments. There's only a limit to how much you can do. With my vision, I did a public health master's degree in between my fourth and fifth year. In fact, in my fifth year, I was a med student and a master student. That was un unheard of. I literally doing two degrees at the same time. Mm. So in the day I was doing medicine, evening I was doing masters, my dissertation. So I did the master's degree. It was really hard time for me because I was doing two degrees. I really wanted to understand how populations move, how they m develop. I wanted to understand the impact of GDP on health outcomes as well. And one of the biggest things I found is we talk a lot about maternal health, children's health, elderly health, cancer, heart disease, diabetes but we do not talk enough about men's mental health. And that really got me on a podcast run a few years ago. Shout out to Minton Minds, uh, uh, brother Abdul um, uh, Zahman. He was the first one to get me on about three years ago because I talk a lot about men's mental health. My mission is to prevent a million men from early death. Wow. So let's take a little rewind, yeah? Okay, so you're one of six mm. children. Correct. You didn't come from an academic background, meaning your parents weren't doctors, dentists and you didn't come from a privileged background either. And a lot of people growing up in that situation, and I can relate to this, bro, mm -hmm. like growing up, didn't really know what career to pursue. Yeah. So how did you know so early on, so early on that you wanted to be a doctor mm -hmm. considering those circumstances? Good question. So I grew up, this, it probably, this is an exclusive by the way, nobody knows this. I grew up with Joe Root. He was like two years younger than me, Joe Root, right. England cricket captain. Okay. So I always wanted to get into cricket. I was very sporty from Sheffield, you know, Sports City. We've got like Nassim Hamed, Kel Brook. We've got the footballers, you know, Jamie Vardy, Jessica Ennis. Very sport. In fact, we compete with Manchester. Yeah, really. For, uh, for, the, <laughs> for, for the title of Britain's sportiest city. Right, right. We always, you know, you've got, you've got a sports city here. 
we've got an English English Institute of Sport. So, you know, boxing, cricket, football, we're always competing in, in terms of who's the sportiest city in the UK. So I grew up in a very sporty city. I wanted to play cricket, you know, for Yorkshire and in England. Uh, but I understood the chances are very slim. You've seen the recent scandal, <laughs> Yorkshire cricket and racism, etc. Mm. You know, Azim Rafiq. We knew that was happening. Yeah. But you couldn't put your finger on it. Now yeah. it's only li- literally only come out in the last few months. Yeah. But we, smart, we knew that was happening. Yeah. You know, 100%. growing up. So cricket, although I was passionate about it and you know reasonably good at it, I knew I wouldn't make a career from it. The second option even now you could say, my side hustle is medicine. So even then side hustle was medicine. That was my side kind of passion. But I was good enough to get in. And I was good at science. And obviously being third generation brown ch- child from the you know inner city areas, yeah. medicine seen as the epitome of success. 100%. So it was, <laughs> I was happy, my parents were happy, and I just applied on the off chance that I'm gonna get in. Uh, alhamdulillah, I managed to get in first time around. So would you say you were naturally academically gifted then and you clocked onto that early on? Very, yeah, very much so. I love reading. I love, you know, I love reading about nature. Actually, I wanted to be a vet, then a dentist, and then medicine was, like, was my third option because I love animals. I love, yeah. I travel the world. Alhamdulillah, I've been to almost 60 countries. I travel, I, I remember when I was like six, seven, eight, I got this fish book, random fishes from like Amazon rainforest orange and green fish then i got like a bird's book random bird i wanted to become a bird spotter so i always had an interest in nature and that's like, an interesting one bird spotter yeah. i've not heard that one before yeah, bro. yeah yeah bird spotting yeah, exactly so it's nature you know like looking at allah's creation and interestingly a couple of months ago there's an article in the bbc news about there's been a migration of birds from scandinavia to the peak district in sheffield or you know between, between yeah. manchester and sheffield and i'm very much interested in migration i went to kenya in 2015 uh, went to see the migration of animals from the, the um, maasai to the serengeti so a very medicine for me is an extension of nature because humans are one aspect of allah's creation mm. allah's created clouds mountains lakes animals fish birds and humans so medicine for me was an extension of my love for nature Interesting, man. So when you were growing up, they say you're the average of the five people you hung around with, right? Yeah. What was your circle of influence like growing up? So my best two friends were super smart and I'm very, very lucky to have them. One of them is now an actuarist, actuarial scientist down in London. Uh, shout out to Haroon, the same year as me. And then one of my closest friends was Terry, who's one year older than me. So he's very smart, uh, academic route. Um, they had no right to get into education, but you know, because they come from underprivileged, disadvantaged underrepresented backgrounds yet they still did right and because of that and being the eldest yeah. i had now a blueprint from them right okay. not from that my own sense. siblings but from them and they were really alhamdulillah allah works in very weird and wonderful ways and for me having them ahead of me or in the case of harun having them in my class yeah was a huge motivator for me to put my head down get the necessary grades to get into med school and you know me and harun he, he was applying for Cambridge, I was applying for Oxford. We had no right to do that. We were like kids from inner city school with like a 13% GCSE pass rate, no blueprint. Yeah. But we just had audacious ambitions. That's pretty interesting, bro. But do you know what's more interesting is that you spent all those years achieving the goal to become a doctor. Yeah. And then you were willing to give it up yeah. in pursuit of entrepreneurship. For me, it was uh, rewarding, fulfilling. But it didn't really spark my interest to the absolute nth level. I wanted to actually be fulfilled and actualized. Medicine was me giving back to the world, but I wasn't giving anything to myself. I felt unfulfilled. What do you mean exactly? So, What do you mean by not getting something for myself? So, for instance, if I retired, the next day they would have put a job advert in the BMJ and got me replaced by another doctor. For 4,000 GP positions, there's 12,000 applications. So all is going to be, you know, for GP training positions, yeah, yeah. there's always going to be a backlog, a bottleneck of applicants. So medicine, you can be replaced quite easily. In entrepreneurship, creativity, there's only one. You are an N equals one. You are one of a, you know, a unique mixture of upbringing, environment, surroundings and aspirations. They all come together to make you a, a unique melting pot who can really carve a difference in the world. Whereas in medicine, I was just doing a job, so to speak. I was, you know, if you go to see me or another doctor, it actually yeah. wouldn't make any difference. You'll get the same level of care. It's interesting you say that because from my interaction with doctors, yeah, they're quite risk averse. Exactly. But you're the opposite. Yeah. You're like yeah. willing to, as I mentioned, give that up yeah. to a certain degree. It's because we know that 95% of business yeah. within the second year. It, it required a mindset, mindset, 
mindset shift. It was a paradigm shift for me. Yeah, I had to, I had to switch gears. Medicine's all about safety and being, having a very low risk tolerance. Yeah. In medicine, you can't tolerate risk because risk means death or injury. Mm. If, if you're a risky doctor, you can't be that. It doesn't make sense. You can't be a risky doctor. But in business, the flip side is very apparent. You have to have risk. You have to have this un undeniable self-belief that I don't know how, but I'm going to pull it off somehow. There's a lot of uncertainty you have to exactly. deal with, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and that's, that's tough, you know. It's not easy as it sounds, bro. It's very tough, bro. You have to have self-belief, though. And you know, the wakal in, in yeah. Arabic, meaning complete reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's yeah. like the bird. I mentioned birds earlier. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> bird flies out in the morning, yeah. hungry. Mm. Doesn't know where he or she's going to get the meal from, but he or she will return back with a mouthful of worms for his kids. Mm. While we're on the topic of business, I think it's a good segue to talk about your Dragon's Den experience, right? Because, you know, you started the business, you started the date smoothie. So obvious question, like, what was the inspiration behind the date smoothie? Well, Ramadan's coming. I don't know, I don't know when you're going to release this episode, but Ramadan's around the corner. Yeah. It was Ramadan. 2016 Ramadan, you know, making, remember they were the long ones, long, long fasts. Yeah. You know, about 10 years ago now. Yeah. They're long, remember they were long, like of course, nine, nine, half, 9.30 iftar. The real fast. Oh, yeah, real fast, exactly. And you shout out to everyone who um, we were studying during them times, because obviously me and you weren't studying at the time, 10 years ago, but guys that were like 18, 19, 20, doing their, do, doing their university exams, doing their A-levels, shout out to them guys, honestly, respect. Because for me, I was working, yeah. but I could take annual leave, so, you know, so could you probably. But guys who were exams, July, June, the peak time for them. So that's when I started. I'm like, what can I have that's going to cool me down and fill me up during these long 19-hour fasts? And it was having a good sahur, having a good sahur, you know, just before dawn, having it with barley and oats and coconut milk and, you know, various kind of milks, as opposed to lactose, you know, being Asian, 25% of us suffer from lactose intolerance, mm -hmm. one in four. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't be gassy all throughout my fast. So I'm like, let me not be gassy and bloated. Let me try alternative milk. So we tried like almond milk, cashew milk, started mixing it with dates. Uh, as a sweetener. When you say we, brother, what do you mean? Who, who with? Is it a partner or, sorry, like, is it, is it friends that you're dealing with? Yeah, so, so uh, uh, we had a small team at, at the time. We had a production team as well. So uh, we were doing it. We had the branding team. We had Sheffield University that were doing the branding, the printing as well. For the date smoothie? For the smoothie, yeah. Right. Alhamdulillah, we, we, yeah, deep, bro. Yeah, yeah, we had to, bro. Jeez. 3D printing. Right, if you right. saw the pitch at the end, there's a little bottle compartment. Yeah, we'll come to that in a second. Yeah, that was, yeah. That was a 3D printer. Right, right, right. And so for me, it was very personal because the, then I took them to work when Ramadan finished. Yeah. I took the smoothies to work right after ramadan okay and it worked out well because people are like this is very unusual it's smooth it's it's quite bitty as well at the same time yeah and it keeps me full it's not like a fruit smoothie which is very high in sugar so you're getting real-time oh. feedback from clients exactly yeah. so in the doctors at the, at the hospital and then alhamdulillah in december christmas markets came around and went there and got a lot of feedback then dragons then contacted us but yeah going back to the point about why it, it was literally 2016, long hot summers, how to make a lasting sahur, a sahur that will last you till 10 p.m. at night time. Mm. And literally that was it. Putting oats, barley, flax seeds, um, alternative milks, which, which are very low in sugar, like cashew, coconut, almond milk, and then putting the dates on there as well. So alhamdulillah, that itself was a meal, a liquid meal. So essentially you're solving your own problem, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. You, in your head you thought, okay, I can solve. There's a lot of Muslims that are there. Mm -hmm. You know, and that can solve their problems as well. Exactly. Basically, you know, product market fit. Absolutely. Need, whatever yeah, it is. yeah. So yeah, essentially, you, uh, it, I think the best solutions come from personal problems. So for me, that was a personal a problem. That was a need. That was a void I had to fulfill. And I'll, so it's two ways to solve problems in business, right? It is to find a problem and to press and push a solution for that. The second way of business is to manufacture a need and then create an artificial solution to that. That's what a, a lot of tech companies do that. Yeah. They will create a, a solution first and then advertise the need. For me, the need was already there. Yeah. I needed something which wasn't the usual toast and cereal in the morning at th two in the morning. It was something that would, was low glycemic index, i.e. it would give me a good supply of glucose for like 18 hours. As opposed to the, the big consistent energy level, yeah, no spike in insulin. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So you wanted that. No crash. No, no crash. So alhamdulillah, it was my own problem, which I solved. And then, yeah, Dragon's Den was a, was a very interesting experience. So you know what's interesting is that you mentioned um, that they contacted you. 
Yeah. Right. I was going to ask you what, cause what's the behind the scenes, what's yeah, the application process like? Yeah, so no, so I applied for it and then I just left it on the back burner because at the time I applied for everything, Virgin Startup Grants, NetWest Business Loans. Yeah. It was before COVID, so there was none of this, um, you know, business recovery loans. It was all, you had to apply for government grants. So we applied for a lot of grants, startup, startup loans. And then Dragon's End was just literally something which I applied for. And then they contacted me after the Christmas markets because Christmas markets happened in, in 2016, 17. Yeah. Got a lot of publicity. Sheffield Star got involved. And then I think on the back of that, Dragon's then would have seen the articles and then they contacted us, give us a, literally give me a phone call in January, first week of January. I was back at work in the hospital. They're like, I couldn't believe it. One of the producers phoned me or yeah, assistant producer phoned me. I, 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 I even remember her name, Lauren. She phoned me. And she said, look, you know, we like, we like, we like the product, we like the idea. Because at that time, I, it had got a lot of traction. Right. Loads of articles about it in, in the local newspapers, in the food journals, etc. And then I think she liked the business idea. And then we had to pitch it to the producers first. Right, right. And then the dragons later. Okay, interesting, yeah. man. <laughs> interesting. So check this out, bro. A lot of people, because um, you talked about all that stuff, right, in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, bro, People don't know how much work and effort it takes to have a startup, bro. Exactly. Operations, logistics. I mean, I was talking to you about this podcast, bro. Yeah. Like I've got a nine to five job. Yeah. I didn't realize how much work a podcast takes, man. It's a flipping full time job itself. Exactly. Editing's like 40 hours. And you gave me the tip to like outsource now. So yeah. outsourcing, I'm going to take that on board. But like in the initial stages, like you were doing thing. Yeah. Operations, marketing, you mentioned yeah. that, oh, it's gaining a bit of traction, but obviously that didn't come by itself, did yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, of course. You've so got you got to. You're putting that graft in, aren't you? Of course you are, yeah. So it's every. So at a startup, when it's only two or three people, you are the CMO, CFO, CEO, CEO. You are all of the C's. It's exactly. actually chief marketing officer as well. You're the chief product officer. You, you take ownership. And yeah. it's, it's it, you know, and I was working at the time as a full time doctor as well, doing night shifts and weekends. That was a tough time. But you know what? I learned so much in them six months. Touching upon what you just said there, you're putting in 12 hour shifts. How do you find the time, bro, like to come home and then start working on the product? Do you get me? Coffee and dates. That's it. Literally coffee and dates. Honestly, yeah. caffeine will, is, is a stimulant, but and dates is a glucose for the brain. Yeah. So you need both. You need glucose as energy. I remember I, I used to come home, go to the gym and then get to work. But you know, Gary, Gary V says, your nine to five will pay the bills. Your nine to nine, sorry, you know, your, sorry, your... Uh, nine to five, yeah. Uh, as in nine a.m. to five p.m. will pay the bills, but your five p.m. to nine a.m. yeah will make your empire. Bro, where's your time to sleep, man? Come on now, oh, yeah, come yeah. on. You have to have, you know, <laughs> but, but even if you work three four hours in the evening, you know, you have to sacrifice sleep a bit. Definitely. No, I have two tomorrow's a bit of tongue and cheek there. Yeah. I understand the concept yeah. there, and plus they say that the weekend is the weapon of the entrepreneur. Exactly. Yeah. You got you got you got look full forty eight hours, um, but instead of Netflix, you know. Netflix and chill and popcorn. Why don't you just work on your business? Yeah. And you, you can still, you know, watch half an hour of TV. You just don't binge watch. Spend at least one hour a day on a business, on a side hustle. And then that one hour will compound like a snowball. And by three to six months, you'll see a huge difference in where you are. Yeah. Um, might be a bit of a personal question, but I think it might be valuable to the audience is how much money and time did you invest prior to going into the dragon? To be honest, I think we were quite good. We bootstrapped a lot of it. Um, Just so people... Yeah, I think it's under £10,000. Okay, decent. Or under, yeah, so yeah, under £10,000 in terms of product because we, we made a lot of profit in return. So we sold, we kept our manufacturing costs very low, yeah. and then whatever, we, whatever revenue we got, a proportion of the revenue was profit, then, and the other one was put back into the marketing of the business. Okay. But at the same time, Instagram just came out, and you know, we had free marketing from that, and you know, influencers, etc. Right, okay, interesting, yeah. interesting, man. Reflecting on your Dragon's End pitch, how do you think you performed? I think I performed confidently. Um, I performed, you probably saw someone who was a bit, you know, took, took the attacks personally as opposed to attack on the business. Because when, when, as you know, when, you, when you're doing a one-man show, you are the brand. Yes. Like you are Tayo Kamal. There's no team, as in like, you can't deflect the blame. So when the dragons were saying the branding's poor or this is poor, I took it as a personal attack on me. Right, so yeah. So that's why I got a bit, I, I put my backs up a bit. And just to give a context to the people that are listening or watching, right? So there's a moment in the Dragon's Den, if you've not watched it, yeah? If you've not watched it, it's uh, Tuka Suleiman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's basically saying, look, I could have a smoothie product tomorrow, put my name on it. 
and it will sell more than you. And your response was? Who is Tuka? Oh, jeez. <laughs> I was going to ask you, bro, like what elicited it? What, what, um, no, what triggered that response basically, yeah. right? Um, but you pretty much answered it. And it reminded me like, when I watched it, bro, I was like, damn. This guy's got this guy's ballsy, you know. Well, five pieces. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, Habib, I'll tell you something, yeah? So when he said I can make a smoothie and it's by the way, I'm giving you exclusives. This stuff no, nobody said before about, about dragons. I'm giving you the deep dive because we're in the city of the dragons, man. It's media city, you know what I mean? We're in the, it's like literally a homecoming. Yeah, tell it, say it to the camera, man. This is exclusive. This is exclusives. Honestly, this is dragons and exclusives. Like, I'm not talking about this, yeah, uh, you know, because but it just feels right to talk about it here because yeah. we're not in London or Birmingham, we're in Manchester. Go on. But it all happened. Literally, media city. That's it. Salford, That's it. Salford, Salford. Salford. Salford yeah. So, my whole, if you saw the pitch and people said I overdid it in terms of in terms of you know bragging i wasn't bragging I, I, people say I, I overdid it in terms of qualifying my credentials i mentioned doctor like 50 times in the pitch which i did i probably did you know like i mentioned it a lot <laughs> but I, I, the reason why i mentioned that habib was to say look i'm not just a business guy i'm a doctor who's made a smoothie i put some respect on a guy's name I, I, I put time and effort into making a smoothie yeah which i didn't speak about islam then but obviously it came from islam to you know dates etc but i thought about it because obviously Muslims sometimes aren't the healthiest. We have the biggest bellies and all that kind of stuff. So I can't just use Islam and say, yes, yeah, a Muslim smoothie. So I'm like, you know, it's an Islamic concept, but I'm a doctor and I thought about this as well. Even, even you, you uh, replied to my story about sweetness, you know, like you replied to my story. I'm very big on making sure it's natural. Yeah. As natural as possible. So I'm like, I made this smoothie from scratch and I thought about it a lot and I'm a doctor. I wouldn't be selling bad things to, to, to the public. Yeah. And the fact that I've mentioned it like 15 times, I'm a doctor, and you're saying, oh, well, I can do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, you've missed the point. Yeah. The point is you can't do the same thing as me because I've thought about it in a deep, in a deep way. That's what you meant, basically. But yes, that's what I that's meant. That's the context behind exactly. the comment. Exactly. Yeah. And it came across as very, very sharp and very direct. But I'm like, you've not been listening. I've just been talking about why I'm different to everyone else. Yeah, 100%. Man. Yeah. And people don't see the effort, as we mentioned yeah, before, yeah. how much you put into it. Um, was there an element of emotional attachment to your products? Yeah, exactly. It was yeah. 100%. I'll, gi I'll give you an example. I, had a, I used to work as a property consultant. Um, and then one of the guys, um, a vendor I was selling for, basically, come on the phone to me and saying, Habib, my property's not selling. I've been in the market for six months, mate. What's going on? So I go, look, vendor, Mr. Vendor, your house... We're selling properties. I'm selling properties on your road. Like literally four just sold last week. I'm trying to indicate basically your house is a bit overpriced, mm. right? But he's been there for 25 years, seen his kids grow up there. Do you know what I mean? It's a emotional different attachment. emotional attachment. Yeah. That's what that's my context behind that question. Yeah, Was yeah, there a bit yeah, of emotional of attachment? Course. Yeah, because yeah. it's got baby. Yeah, yeah. And you don't want anyone calling a baby ugly. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, yeah, yeah. that's what it is, right? It's, you take ownership of it. Especially when you are a startup. You are the chief marketing officer, you are the chief product officer. You are the CEO, the CEO, you, literally everything. You, you, you do the balance sheets, you do the product publicity, product placement, you do the outbound sales calls. So when someone attacks the concept and the product, you're like, no, you, you don't really know the, the, the kind of effort we put into it. Yeah, because they, they're the guys with leverage in it. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? They they're got sat the leverage. there with a massive toolkit for them, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think people took it like, you're not there to build a bridge. You were there yeah, to yeah. like custom up, basically. Yeah, that's right. yeah, <laughs> do, yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, would you, this is a question that came from my Instagram, actually. Um, w w one of the guys asked, are you open to criticism? Now I am. Then yeah. I wasn't. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, then I think I was like... I'm the dog's bollocks, you know, like this is a product I've made, it's a big gap in the market, it solved my problem, it solved so many people's problems. Why, why, why aren't you seeing it? And yeah. I was so convinced I'm going to get the investment, so convinced. Yeah. I thought at least one of them will invest in this. Because yeah. Dates is quite, literally that same year, 2016, you can check this out. That's when Pret and all these other coffee chains started doing date smoothies. Literally that same year. I remember. Right. Because right. I, I went to a, Halal Food Festival or Muslim, it was in Manchester actually, in Trafford, Centre, uh, Trafford Park. Oh, okay, yeah. 2016, there was a Halal... Lifestyle show. Yeah, that's the one, MLS. Yeah. A Muslim lifestyle show. And I was pitching the idea of date smoothies then. And honestly, like people from Myla Horde, etc., they're like, this is a great idea. Yeah. No, nobody's done it before. We could do this instead of gulab, gulab jamun and all these. We could actually date, do date smoothies. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, we're, we're on the brink of something. So when in Dragons contacted me, they is literally just were only just getting you know seen as a superfood. Yeah. Now you've in Manchester you got you got the acai bars and your acai balls and all, all these smoothies. Yeah. But 2016, eight yeah. years ago, yeah, it was literally at the beginning of the beginning of the wave. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I thought, let me do it. I'm a doctor. I can just I literally 
sell this in a good way. Um, but uh, so I was very gassed about my own con conception. And then when they attacked the product, I, I felt a bit personally insulted. Yeah. But yeah, I've learned now to take criticism, you know, like a stoic, have a, th have a thick skin, understand where it's coming from. And they say the smart person or the wise person is one who can build houses from the stones others throw, throw at him. Yes. So whatever stones you throw, I can build a house from that. So would you say that's your biggest takeaway from the Dragon's Den experience? Yes, yeah? yes. Interesting, man. You know, at the end of the day, I know it's not no longer in operation, the date smoothie, but you never, what I say is that you never lose, man. You either win or you learn in it. Exactly. You learn, you leverage, you, you know, you take the L on the chin and you, and you go forward. The great champions have always had some losses in their life. 100% bro. While we're on the theme of business, I want to touch upon your coaching business. Yeah. If that's okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, you coach men, helping them to be modern Muslim man, well-dressed, well-presented, well-spoken, in shape on Dean. That's right, yeah. I like that, man. <laughs> it's good, that. Um, how did you identify a need for this service? So a lot of brothers were coming to me post-divorce and they were out of shape, you know, physically, firstly, but most importantly and most damagingly, they were out of shape spiritually. They weren't praying their salahs. They were, they, weren't, they were sleeping in the Fajr. They weren't even praying. Like, they were even missing Juma, bro. Literally, they were in their rooms missing Juma. Why? Because I've just had a divorce, I miss my kids. I'm like, well, I need to reset your mindset to, to use that loss as a gain. It's called post-traumatic growth. And because a lot of these men were second and third generation Asian migrants to the UK, they had a very scarcity mindset. Yeah. They didn't have a growth mindset. So they saw setback as life changing, as life altering, as devastating. But in fact, setback has been, it's, it's in the Quran. So, almost so many setbacks, setbacks. Yeah. But everyone had a comeback after the setback. All the prophets had a comeback. Yeah. You're just seeing the setback as, as devastating. It's a very scarcity mindset. It's a very Asian, second, third generation culture mindset, which is a colonial inferiority complex where you see setbacks as life ending. Yeah. So I'm like, no, transmute the setback into something that's going to make you a better person, into version two or three or four, not just the version 1.0, who's lying in his bed, wallowing in his self-pity. So my, essentially my coaching revolved around getting men back in shape, spiritually, mentally, physically, aesthetically. And if they were to, if they were to get married again, who's going to marry you if you're just a bum? Literally, you're a bum. That's all you're doing. In, you wow. know? So I'm like, get back in shape, I mean, go to the masjid, pray salah with Jummah, lose some weight or build muscle, whatever the case may be, learn how to dress properly. Yeah. Um, learn how to speak confidently. Yeah. So you can get job interviews, etc. You know, just getting them back in back on track. Because a lot of these men had a setback and they fell so deeply into I wouldn't say depression, but they fell deeply into kind of malaise and lethargy and I wouldn't say depression, like depression is a medical it's a medical term. Yeah. But they fell into self pity. Self pity, okay. But that's a key word actually to be fair. Do you know, I, I can't remember where I read it, but there's an article like top five traumas, yeah. traumatic experiences in life. Divorce. Divorce is up there, bro. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it is quite traumatic. It hits you, it hits you. Bang, it hits it's you. It's up there among losing yeah. your son, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like it's, 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 one, it's top two, I know that. So it's, it's, it's losing a loved one and divorce is number two. So these guys got hit, but the Quran gives us the blueprint yeah. for coming back from setback. You know, Islam, I think about this a lot. You know, Islam wants you to be a very strong masculine man. Literally, the Quran, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look, you know, we talked about this with a few podcasts in the, uh, in the past about polygamy, etc. Uh, literally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to have four wives. As in, like, if you look at the, the context, it says, marry four through your two, if not one. Marry four through two, if not one. So, but what is it want? A bit of a stretch. Yeah? Who wants you to marry four? Is that, is that a bit of okay, a stretch? Okay. No, the no. option is there. No, 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 yes. So, not want. Not want. Uh, I take that back. What I'm saying is, option is there. But the fact that Allah has made it permissible yeah. means you need to step up to the plate. Mm. You need to step up to the plate. Mm. How can you, you can't even look after one woman because you're not in shape, you're not financially in shape, whatever. So, the fact that polygamy is permissible in Islam means that a man should be in a position whether he wants to take it or not that's a different matter by the way okay. whether he wants to whether he wants to utilize and this and and you know uh, and i take up the offer that allah's put i like that yeah, i've not heard anyone word it yeah. that way before be in a position where you can exactly but you don't need to i like that exactly I like that. yeah so be in a position but how do you get in a position to actually have or to be polygamous 
You need to be financially in shape, mentally in shape, emotionally in shape, physically in shape, yeah. socially in shape. And these men I was coaching weren't in e position to even get married once because they'd been hit with a setback, bang, that's it. So my aim as a coach was to get them back in shape, physically, mentally, aesthetically, the way they dressed, the way they groomed, the way they spoke. And uh, the, you know, shockingly, they weren't even praying. I'm like, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is a rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a rope, hablullah. Yeah. Open his book, get back, get back in the masjid. You, are, you belong, as a Muslim man, you belong in the masjid. Why are you not even going to the masjid? Then they, they use trauma to stun their growth. Trauma should be a, a springboard to get to the next level. And this is actually called post-traumatic growth. Yeah. Post-traumatic growth is where you, you have a bit of a setback, but like a catapult, you go back and you, you shoot forward. It propels you forward. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So what are some of the common pain points that men come to you with? I know you mentioned divorce, but specifically there might be some specific point, pain points that they come to you with. What's the most common one, would you say? The most common one is an unfulfilled marriage. Right. Yeah. So that's a lot of men come to me saying, look, I've been married for 20, 30 years. My wife doesn't like me anymore, doesn't love me anymore. But then I, I speak to the guys, I'm saying, would you blame her? Because you have let yourself go. You become complacent. You're no longer fulfilling the masculine leadership role. Right. You're indecisive. You don't, you're not a man of your word. You don't even pray. You don't lead your family in salah. You have no direction. You're not upskilling on the side. You're not doing anything extraordinary. You don't have a life mission. Mm. So, of course, uh, what do you expect her to, you know, to praise you to the high heavens? Yes, she, she should respect you, but women will lose interest if you're not that, that guy anymore. And so you need to get back in shape. And most importantly, you, you need to get close to your deen and command respect in a way that I'm the man, I'm the rajal. I can lead my family in terms of times of distress. And a lot of men weren't doing that. They were very complacent. And it goes back to, like I keep saying it, man, Salah. You know, sh show me a man's salah and I'll show you his personality. Hmm. Not heard that one before. But it's true. You come out with gems, bro, in these bro, podcasts, I you know. I say this to you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Show me his salah and I'll show you his personality. Right. Because right. this is, this is, he knows the maqam of his Lord. You know what I mean? Maqam in place. Or place, yeah. Standing are, of his Lord. Yeah. He knows the standing of his Lord. Where yeah. does he stand? Um, so a lot of these brothers weren't even praying. I'm like, you know what? If you don't pray, you, you get taken out of the fault of Islam. Yeah. So you're culturally a Muslim, but you're not actually a Muslim. And this is something I, you know, if I can change the mindset of a lot of people. Yeah. Bro, pray, man. So check this out, right? You mentioned a couple of things that you opened up quite a few things in my mind, right? But would you say that's the most common reason for divorce in men, that they lose their purpose, their goals, their ambition, yeah. everything that makes them a man, really? Decisiveness, mm -hmm. these sort of qualities. Would you say that's the common reason for divorce from your 10 years of coaching experience? Is that... The main, from the man side of yeah. it. Yeah, from, okay, from the man side, I would say yes. I prefer to look at what the cause is in men. Like why is a woman initiating divorce? What, what's the reason for it? And oftentimes you find a lot of these men simply have lost track yeah. of their life's purpose. They've kind of gone off kilter. They need to get realigned. Realigned with what? The fitrah. Because inherently a woman wants a man who's a man, a man who's a rajal who's in his masculine frame. And a lot of these men aren't. They complain, they moan, they're lazy, they're out of shape, they lack leadership, they lack executive functioning. Every single thing that makes him a man, he lacks now. Spe speaking about giving the brothers the hard time, right? You heard about the red pill movement, yeah? Yes. Okay, so you're familiar with it? Yeah. Okay, good. So check this out, bro. We always hear this rhetoric, right? I want a traditional woman. Yeah, yeah. And I got a question uh, for you. I think you're very experienced to answer this question, right? So for example, we always hear, oh, I want a traditional woman, I want a traditional woman cook, clean, raise mm. children, etc. right? But the emphasis when they're being raised by their parents isn't to cook, clean, raise children. It's education. It's go out and get a degree, go out and work. And then all of a sudden, when they do get married, now immediately they're expected to cook, clean, raise children immediately. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, do you yeah, see a problem yeah. there, bro? Huge problem, bro. There's a huge problem in lack of... I've I, I got in trouble for this, by the way. Um, but, uh, someone said to me, I said, you, you know, you're saying women aren't trained for marriage. But in Islam, men and women should be trained for marriage. Because marriage is our ultimate purpose, right? Marriage is a maqasid al-sharia. The maqasid is one of the, re it's one of the ways of propagation of Islam. You know, Rasul told us, marry women who are fertile and loving so you can have more children, so I can boast about your numbers on the Yom Al-Qiyamah. So 
And also, marriage prevents zina and fahsha and all these kind of things. So marriage is an institution which is very sacred in Islam. But to get to that level, you need to have some sort of, I hate the word training, but you need to have some sort of conditioning that you are going to be someone's husband and you're going to be someone's wife. Both our conditionings and socializations are off, especially for the boys. They're being raised to be mummy's boys. And the women, they are kind of forced to be workers and career ladies. So it's a concoction for disaster. 100%. You know, and this mixing of culture with Islam, with feminism, three way, it's like a three way, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Mixing. But going back to the, the, the traditional thing I was saying about the, you know, the women aren't trained to be like this. I'm going to flip on the men in a second as well. Don't worry. Um, is the other thing is that, you know, a, a man wants a traditional woman. Yeah. But yet, you know, in this society, bro, let's get real, man. It's very difficult to raise a household on one income. Exactly. So now you're expecting a traditional, uh, now, you're, now you're expecting a traditional woman, but you want her to chip in as well, mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. and be part of the providing process. It's, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, it's like well, how do we... She's getting a bad deal. How do we bridge the gap? Yeah, she, so she's getting a bad deal in that sense because she, she's expected to, to give you your rights to having a, a traditional life. But then you're not fulfilling your rights to be the complete provider for her. Yeah. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to get yeah. at is that it should men and women have a deep understanding of this before they get yeah. married, really? 100%. I, it's, it's what I offer. I have a lot of men marital uh, coaching and counseling as well, and women as well, like in groups, like a couple's therapy be before they get married. Because a big cause of divorce is not knowing your rights and responsibilities. People just look up women or men, you know, they say you should look with your ears. Yeah. Look with your ears. It's very difficult for a man though. Exactly. Let's get real, bro. Look, exactly. It is difficult for a man, but you got to look with your ears. You can't just look with your eyes and say, oh, you know what? That's because what happens, you, your, your God lowers, your non-negotiables and red flags go, go out the window. So you have to have, you have to have a, a set standard, which you wouldn't go below. But at the same time, you've got to match the offering. So what do you bring to the table? And what does she bring to the table? And is the equity there? If she's bringing all this to the table and, and, and you know, you're only bringing two out of five things, from the outset, there's no compatibility. And what's gonna happen is that marriage is gonna be, f it's gonna be full of discontentment because yeah. you think or she thinks she can do better than you. Yeah. So there has to be compatibility from the outset. Just be realistic. Exactly, be realistic. I bring this, you bring that, let's talk. Yeah. For a man, he's expected, for example, let's flip it to the men actually. For a man, he's expected to now have his financials in order. Yeah. yeah? Ferrari, yeah, house, yeah, yeah, exactly. be a doctor, for example, yeah? And provide everything. But again, he hasn't been taught this just to give, you know, yeah. some breathing space to the men, yeah? yeah. You know, it's called, um, it's two things that's called here. It's, uh, it's called uncommunicated needs yeah. and unspoken expectations. And that's, I think, you can really plug that in the description of the podcast because that's what's causing a lot of embitterment. So what do you expect in a marriage? What do you expect from a man? What do you expect from me if I was to be your wife? What do you expect from that, you know, from a future spouse? Communicate that effectively with, with, with crystal clarity. So none of you are in the dark as to what the other person expects. And then also communicate your needs. If he or she is falling short, communicate your needs. And to, to be a good communicator, to be a clear, to, to be a clear, um, concise, clear communicator, you have to have a degree of emotional literacy. A lot of men aren't emotionally, um, emotionally literate. They will still Do you get, mean like emotional intelligence? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. EQ. Yeah. So your EQ instead of IQ. So I know a lot of people have got very high IQ, but EQ is your emotional quotient, your intelligence part, your, 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 that's a real intelligence, right? H how you speak and how you diffuse your emotions, how you process them. And a lot of men in their 30s and 40s are still having anger out outbursts and hissy fits like children. You shouldn't be doing that. You, you should have your stuff together as a man. You should be composed. It's not to say you, you, you need to be a robot, but you need to have enough emotional maturity to regulate any swings in emotions. Yeah. Men aren't regulating, they're, they're literally blasting out or they're being very withdrawn, as in they're going from one, one extreme to another. A man is measured. And this is a part of being you know, a being rajul. You're not phased by outside events. You've got to have thick, thick skin. And that's, that's when you can lead. If you're a man who's going to throw, throw a hissy fit every time something happens in an argument in the house, then that man's not worthy of respect. Yeah. And the only way you can develop that is being in uncomfortable situations. Exactly, right? on purpose. If you yeah. look at Dave Goggins, you know, yeah. that's yeah, yeah. exactly what he talks about. 
being purposely being purposely discomfortable yeah being comfortable being discomfortable yeah. you know uncomfortable yeah 100 percent, man so I, i've got a question i'm gonna end this segment um is actually an instagram question but before i forget i'll just mention it now it's basically um a person saying that look i've, I've got my stuff in order yeah. um i'm ready to get married etc but i can't find the right one mm. what advice would you give to someone who's looking for their right one this person is approaching their 40s now any tips top two tips maybe and it's a woman isn't it so the lady that asked this yeah so i get a lot of women d- dm in their 30s and 40s so kind of mid mid to late 30s usually because as, as a man i think you've got a bit more time right but as a woman obviously because of biological clocks it's, it's a bit less time so the, you have to calibrate your expectations so if you're if you're at an age which i don't like using the word but if you're you know like past the age of being youthful then you, you can't expect a, a younger spouse in that sense and this especially for the, for the sisters so a lot of sisters you ask them uh, what do you want and they're like 35 or 32 or 39 they're like i want a guy my age but a guy your age is not looking like the women you know his age that's how harsh it sounds yeah it's harsh it, it does sound harsh but it's like saying it's like saying uh, you know i'm a uh, you know uh, uh you know I, i'm six foot as a guy i want six foot w- women like no you want women shorter than you as a guy you want women younger than you you know what i mean so mm. we, we, when it comes to height we're happy with that we're happy for a difference but when it comes to age it becomes very misogynistic when men want younger women I'm tr- but, but but let's say just to pose this is the question um sorry to cut you off there bro that's okay but just let's say she's got her expectations yeah spot on yeah she wants someone 50s she's 40 for example she wants someone 50s she just can't find the right person they all for example what we mentioned before yeah. mommy's boys i've got the stuff in order because i know people in our age category as well that are brothers i'm talking about as well that just can't they've got their stuff in order they can't really find the right one yeah they're looking the right wrong places yeah. i know it's a difficult one don't get me wrong yeah, it's yeah. a broad question bro it's, like yeah. do you know what i mean I don't want to get your Moroccan thing, <laughs> your, your dating app involved in that one, yeah? But yeah, yeah. What, what I'm saying is like, is there any like top one tip where, because that is a concern at the moment, that is a problem at the moment, people, good people can't yeah. find good okay. people. Okay, no, it's a very good question. And there's no one solution, but, but yeah. the best solution is if you're not waking up for the hajjad, you don't want, you don't want it badly enough. That's all I can say in the matter. That's all I can say. I don't want to recommend this or that or do this practical tip. But honestly, the hajjud, tie your camel. Yeah. That is the hajjud. It's the arrow, right? It's the arrow, exactly. It's hit the target. Exactly. Okay. Nice, concise. Fair enough, man. That's that's the one. Okay. I want to extract some uh, knowledge from your expert, your specialized field, being a doctor, etc. cetera. Uh, we'll move on to this segment, right? And online, social media especially, there's all this... Um, movement towards holistic natural healing i don't know if mm. you come across it right yes and basically the message is for people that don't know is that look heal yourself heal yourself naturally stay away from medicine and all that kind of stuff right um now as a gp who specializes in medicine do you think the medicine interferes with the natural healing route is that a contradiction there yeah. would you say or yeah uh, a, a, con- a, a contradiction but let me uh, just uh, rephrase i'm not a gp so yeah. I, I, okay. I, I'm, i'm a kind of general medical doctor like uh, working in acute medicine but yeah pharmaceuticals for me are yeah. big are big poisons okay huge poisons like i know people who have a headache and straight away they take paracetamol take ibuprofen like you do not know the long-term effects that's having on your kidneys and liver you know so i'm i'm definitely a big proponent a big advocate of natural healing processes traditional islamic traditional chinese etc that's actually rare for a doctor exactly bro. very rare because yeah. i see the bigger picture i see that the pharmaceutical industry is very heavily driven by profit margins big pharma you know big pharma yeah big pharma they they work like big corporations yeah they try to uh, evade tax to minimize their their you know reported outgoings yeah they are very big on getting you know we know we talk about in business monthly recurring net re- revenue and that's what they want you know they have these big deals with nhs and all these healthcare providers and they want maximum bang for buck essentially because they spend millions on r d so we're yeah. spending 50 million to discover a new, a new drug you want to make at least two billion from the drug you know from, from that drug you want to get a four times roi it sounds like you're saying these companies are profiting from disease absolutely there's yeah. no doubt about that yeah there's not you know why cure a disease when it's a nice cash cow i wouldn't cure it it's you know 
obviously we have our morals and ethics as Muslims, but that's why gambling is haram, alcohol is haram, mm -hmm. but, you know, sex industry is haram. So many things are haram because yeah. then there's no benefit in it. It's, it's a net negative for society. Pharmaceutical industries, they benefit from disease. They benefit from having you hooked on the drug. If you cure someone, you've lost a customer for life. So don't cure them. Just get, you know, just inoculate them just slightly beyond, you know, beneath cure. Because cure is a customer gone. And also, modern lifestyles are making us sick. Modern lifestyles are all about making us sedentary, making us hooked on sugar, additives, emulsifiers, preservatives, colorings, e-numbers. Modern lifestyles are literally making us sick. Our concentration spans have, have, have got, uh, dwindled. Our attention has massively reduced. This opened up a new industry of caffeine tablets and you know ADHD medications. So you make a new disease, you make a new product, you make more profit. It, it, it sounds like, you know, almost, it almost sounds like, you know, medicine keeps you on a perpetual continuous cycle of dependency. Yeah, so I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. Yeah. So let's say you get anti-reflux problem, you go yeah. to your doctor, they, they give you some medication for the anti-reflux, right? But then that anti-reflux tablet gives you other symptoms such as constipation, right? Now they're giving you tablets for the constipation and it's ongoing cycle. Exactly. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah. So it's a very fair assessment and I'm very glad you've got insight looking from the outside in. Because from someone who's from the inside looking out, yeah. this is definitely a tangible problem. It's a notice, noticeable material problem because what's happened is we've got, when I was at med school, almost 20 years ago now, like 18 years ago, we didn't have the problem, problem of polypharmacy. Polypharmacy is a big problem now. Polypharmacy and multimorbidity. What's polypharmacy? So, so, uh, Sorry, educate uh, me. Yeah, so polypharmacy is interesting because you've got people on 12 medications. One of them is because you've got low blood, uh, low blood pressure, but then another one's because you've got high, high BP. So it's essentially treating one thing and then you're giving a, a drug to you know reduce symptoms of the first thing. Ah, uh, okay, so that's essentially what I just said, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, and also then you feed into multimorbidity which is someone who's got diabetes, but because they've got diabetes, so someone's got asthma, because they've got asthma, they take a lot of steroid uh, tablets for the asthma. Because of, st because of st steroid tablets, they're now um, diabetic. Because they're diabetic, they're obese. Because they're obese, they've got heart problems. Because they've got, you know, so it's like a vicious cycle. So they, they start off with one thing, then they have three or four things. And this, that's called multimorbidity. And this was not around at medical school. You had one thing, you get treated for that. You may get another thing, but it's not related to the first thing. It yeah. might just be incidental or accidental. Whereas now there's a knock-on effect from the first thing. The first condition leads to the second condition. And then you've got someone who's got four conditions. Each condition has got two tablets. So you've got eight tablets right there. Big Pharma is pocketing a lot of profit from one from one patient. Yeah, and it's almost like they're not treating the root cause, yeah? Exactly. On purpose, as you yeah, mentioned, yeah, yeah, to make yeah. money. So for example, if you've got inflammation, yeah, yeah um, they're going to give you some medication to treat the arthritis yeah, which is yeah, the yeah. symptom right exactly but they're not treating the root cause man which is which, all, which could be obesity which yeah could, you know, which could be so many things but let's get people let's get it's a very good book called sicko i think but uh, not a book movie by michael myers uh, you know michael myers the yeah, guy yeah, yeah. Oh, sicko is essentially how american health culture as health culture it's got people hooked on tablets but it's, it's actually not a health culture it's, it's a sickness culture because health is preventing illness our culture, our dependency on tablets, yeah. it's not preventing illness, it's actually promoting illness and disease because that's what fuels consumerism. Yeah, 100%. And our South Asian community is guilty of this, bro. Like, I'll, I'll just say it, man, like my, my, within my family, bro, the elders, for example, they're dependent on tablets, man. And I think exactly. the tablets long term, especially those in their 60s plus, it kind of deteriorates your health in the long run, man. Yeah, of course. And why do you think there's no emphasis on that, on our communities, man, or awareness? Because we we want a deferred uh, so we want immediate gratification. So not taking tablets, you'll lose that in the short term, as in your pain will still be there. You won't get immediate relief for your headache or from your toothache or from your reflux. But in the long term, you'll benefit. In the long term, by not taking these tablets, you'll benefit. You know, I was reading a study saying that if you take ibuprofen as a woman, your grandchildren's if if, if you have female grandchildren. Their, their, their ovaries will get affected, their fertility will get affected. Wow, talking about grandchildren, exactly. that's like your children's children. Exactly, Mad. so something to do with the ov you know, ovaries and liver function, kidney function. But that's just ibuprofen, yeah? It's just something, you can get neurofen from the chemist. 
So better, better, better not to take them because they're not made with. They're not made. Firstly, for long term gain, they're made for. They they they're made for short term relief. Yeah. You know all these paracetamols, analgesics. They're made for short term relief, yeah. but short term relief uh, relief leads to long term addiction. Once they've got you hooked to long term addiction, they've got a monthly recurring revenue model, which is a nice sweet money maker for them. Right, 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 right. But we're we're trying to go from the angle of prevention is better than cure, though. Exactly, isn't it? Yeah, prevention is better than cure, and uh, Islam teaches holistic medicine, as in, Rasul told us that black seed oil is a cure for everything except death. So, the only way to cure disease is to prevent to, to prevent it in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, to prevent disease by having a moderate, uh, you know, being moderate in your um, food intake, exercising regularly. <coughs> looking after your oral health, looking after your social health, going to the masjid. Yeah. So Islam teaches moderation in every single sense. And also we know that the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, is the strong believer is better than the weak believer. Yeah. So it's very important to be physically in shape, to be you know, exercising regularly. It's very important to have a good nu- nutritional balance. Don't eat excessively. We know how important it is to eat in moderation, eat communally as well as a family, eat communally. And know your portion size. Very yeah. important. You know, yeah, yeah. Ramadan coming now. The amount of rice we eat in our culture, the amount of white carbohydrates we eat in our culture. Shout out to the Bangladeshis of the rice, man. White rice. We bro. love our rice, bro. Yeah, yeah, lots of white rice. So that's why the highest proportion of diabetes is, is in the uh, Bangladeshi community. It is. It's huge, it is. huge amounts there. Yeah. Now that's down to the carb, you'd say. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. 100%, man. So as a health professional, you obviously know like how the body works, etc. When did you start your own? When, do you, when did you decide to focus on your own health journey, man? That's quite an interesting conversation to be Yeah, fair. so I think when I went to university, I was always, always into training. I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the podcast, I was into cricket, etc. When I went to university, I started weight training, like properly. I used to weight train 16, 15, 16, 17. But when you go to university, you've got a bit more freedom. You can go to the gym because university, the, the gym's on campus. So that's, that's when I started at 18, uh, training at the gym. And I understood that if I'm... If I want to be an authority in the space of health and wellness, mm. I must be a picture of health myself. I must be in shape. I must look after my joints. I must be, you know, physically aspirational. When people look at me, they must say, I want to be like him, you know, his shape. In, not in an arrogant way. You've got to lead by example. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like an architect who's got a bad house himself or a mechanic who's got a banged up car. You won't actually bring that home. Yeah. Charity begins at home as we know, and, and, and you are your own home. And, you know, I, I hate using the word temple, but your body is a temple, you know, in that sense. Look after it, right? Cherish it. And in Islam, we say it's an amana. Yeah. Your body is an, is an amana. It's not your body. Allah's given you the body. Look after it. Treat it like a Ferrari. We mentioned Ferrari earlier. You know, yeah, treat your body like a Ferrari. Put good fuel in it. Like, even now, I've not eaten for, like, 22 hours. I eat once a day. Yeah, okay. Because you know to say the, I, I've started to do that as well, by the way. Omad. I, got, I got it from Andrew Tate. Yeah, exactly. One yeah. meal a day on you know, Omad, one meal a day. Bro, it's a game changer. Really? Your focus. energy level is consistent exactly. No crashes. No crashes. Is your did your meal when you do eat? You're big. Consistent of meat yeah, yeah, mainly meat, yeah, right? Yeah, mainly meat, mainly fats, small amount, very little carbs, but I'm very big on a slow carb diet. Yeah. So yeah. beans, lentils, okay. legumes, slow carb diet. Yeah. Not having, you know, quick quick carbs. Quick carbs are like your white, your white rice, your, your pastas, your, you know, potatoes, white, you know, that's very, anything which is beige and white in color. Yeah. Slow carbs is things which are like legumes, beans, lentils, seeds, nuts. That's a slow carb diet. Yeah. So I'm big, if I'm to have carbs, it's going to be that. The only challenge I have with the one meal a day, right, is if I go hard in the gym, yeah. the next day I am marvin, bro. Like, I need yeah, yeah. a scrum at 12. Like, I can't wait till... So do you get that challenge? I do, yeah, I do, I do. So sometimes then I'm a bit more generous. I will have my one meal earlier. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. No, normally I'll, I'll have the meal at 4 or 5 p.m. So it's neither a lunch nor a dinner. And I skip breakfast anyway, by default. But if I'm really starving by the next day, I'll have a breakfast. But th- that'll be my only meal of the day. Mm. So I won't have lunch that day, no dinner. I'll just bring my meals earlier. Yeah. So final question for this segment, man, because as we mentioned uh, to start this segment off, is that everyone's moving towards holistic medicine. And it's refreshing to see someone, a doctor, on the, on board with this, man, because doctors are not about that life, man. Yeah, exactly. So where's the starting point, bro, for people that want to take it seriously? Uh, two things. People often think getting in shape is about working out. But 80% of your shape 
of your physique is your diet, is your nu nutrition and recovery as well, your sleep, right? 80%. And secondly, if you want to get in shape, start with your mind. How do you change your mindset with regard to fitness? See fitness as a necessary component of your self-actualization. See fitness as a marker of self-respect. Because you can't see self-respect. You, you can't see respect. It's, it's, it's an intangible, immaterial concept. But you can see self-respect in someone's physique. Yeah. And I think that's probably, if you just reframe fitness as me showing self-respect to myself, once you've changed that, once you've undergone cognitive reframing as my physique is a representation of my inner worth to the world, then you will change your relationship with fitness and food. And we're not necessarily just talking about get a six pack. Yeah. We're not talking vanity metrics here. We're talking just get in shape, slim, have a low body fat percentage. Have a flat stomach. Yeah, like flat stomach. Literally. Sunnah. Sunnah. Rasul Sallallahu had a flat stomach. It didn't yeah. protrude. Had ridge. You said that he had ridges, right? Exactly. So yeah. they said when he was lying flat, you could see ridges. Yeah, which is and six pack. Six, bro, you know they say, um, it's a saying of one of the Salaf, I believe, or one of the pious predecessors who says, if someone eats one meal a day, that, that is what the Anbiya used to do. And if you have two meals a day, that's what the Salaf used to do. And if you have three meals a day, that's like an animal. Yeah, wow. So they said, they said, you know, like, if they eat three meals a day, make like a hole in the ground for them. Yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Was, you know, as like, in, you know, you know, where horses and all that eat, like yeah, a hole, yeah, yeah, like a yeah. little hole. Yeah. So look, Anbiya, one meal a day, the, these, the pious predecessors, two meals a day, and three meals a day is for animals. Yeah. You shouldn't be eating three meals a day. It's a big con. It goes back to consumerism. Yeah. Why breakfast was invented at the industry? It's propaganda. Kellogg's, who was, you know, yeah. Dr. John Harvey Kellogg was an Irish e eugenicist, Irish doctor, was very big on consumerism and, you know, uh, eugenics, one race is better, better than the other. It's a whole marketing spiel. It's nothing to do with health and wellness. It's to do with getting profit. Because if you created an industry, for cereal, yeah. you've created a multi-billion dollar you know, companies just from just from introducing something that didn't need to be there. Interesting, man. Interesting. Let's take it back to business, bro. Mm. The Apprentice, mm -hmm. a lot of controversy surrounding it. We obviously know it brought about some challenges post yeah, yeah, of show. Course. Yeah. yeah. If you don't mind, let's explore that a little bit because yeah. we're up, everyone's up to date. Yeah. This is the latest now. What's the current situation, would you say, right now? Because from Ahmed Yaku's post, yeah. Mr. There's a defense for every offense. <laughs> Shout out to you, brother. The legend. Legend. He was saying that, look, you're potentially facing deregistration from the medical register. That's right, yeah. So actually, yeah. th that happened. So I was suspended. Oh. Yeah, suspended like two weeks ago. Oh, devastating news, so, bro. It's, it's, so not deregistered, still registered, but right. unable to work until we file a formal legal defense against them. Are you working with Ahmed without? Uh, oh, no. I can't tell that. Okay, okay. No, fair enough, <laughs> yeah. fair enough, fair enough. But so, eh, Ahmed is a good friend, and Ahmed, you know, vote Ahmed Yakub in the um, in the summer elections in Birmingham. Lady would get, uh, if, uh, should we get him on the pod. Yeah, yeah, I'm not invited him yet, but yeah. listen, more than welcome. We'll definitely put a reach out to that. Um, so yeah, so that's the post at the moment, and just so we can backtrack a little bit. I know it's quite common news now, to be honest. You've been talking about it on the other podcasts, but just for my audience, just in case they yeah. don't know what happened, what what series of event led to that process taking place like you being, yeah. you know. So I was, I was very vocal in my condemnation of the Israeli genocide against Gaza. And because I was, they accused me of being anti-Semitic, which I am not, but they conf conflated both of them together. And they accused me of being anti-Semitic. The Jewish Medical Association reported me to my regulator, which is a general medical council. And they thought for pu public protection, for public interest, we have to suspend Dr. Munaf from the register, which which they did about 10 days ago. Okay. Obviously, we know the, I think we all know what, what I go on here, but yeah, do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? So we don't need to go into detail on that yeah. one, right? Everyone's got half a brain, knows yeah. what's, what's happening. Um, but having said that, bro, it's a big test. Mm -hmm. how, how are you coping, bro? Be, be honest. I know don't, I know you can say it's all cool and all this, bro. Yeah. I get that, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Let's, be, let's be pragmatic a little bit. Yeah. yeah? How are you coping, bro? Be honest. But honestly, I'm coping very well, alhamdulillah. Yeah, this alhamdulillah. is legit, like yeah. man to man. Wallah, I'm coping very well. I've got good yeah. brothers around me, alhamdulillah. Older brothers who've been through the trenches as well. I've got brothers who's been through the same thing 20 years ago. He went through a witch hunt, 2005 it was. You know when the 7-7 seven -seven happened? Yeah. The, 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 uh, the bombings in London. The, our brother lost his job because of this, because of talking about it. 
He wrote right. an article in The Guardian. Right. The local, uh, um, local Sheffield lad. I've got Dr. Abdul Wahid, who's been supporting me. Yeah. GP. Yeah. I've been speaking to him quite uh, regularly. I've got another doctor, Dr. Raj, who's up in Sheffield. He's been, um, he's had similar problems with the regulator, with the police since two, two, uh, 2008, way before me. So I've got people, you know what they say, you look further by standing on the shoulders of giants. Yes. And these guys are, you know, giants in that sense. They've been through it. I've got, you know, Dilly, brother Hamza, sorts of Hamza, they've all reached out to me, you know, personally as well. Yeah. You know, and they said, Look, Top brothers, man, to have around you, man. Good brothers, man. Do you know what I mean? Good brothers. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen the podcast, by the way, with Dilly Hussein. That was quite a tough one, man. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's a tough interviewer. Yeah. He's the best man to talk about this subject here. So Absolutely. I'm going to leave that to the professionals. You get me? He's, 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 a, he's a G in that sense. Absolute G, man. So you've got the support that you need. You mentioned Alhamdulillah. Yeah. yeah. It's important to have a brotherhood, man. You know what I mean? With, even like Ahmed Yaqub, yeah. you know, legally, all them, you know, you know Dotting the dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Yeah. Because when you're so far in the trenches, you sometimes lose sight of the bigger picture. So it's good to have objective assessments and evaluations of the next best step. Yeah. You have to have that macro lens where you zoom out of the situation and see, yes, this might make sense now, mm. but what about in three to six months? Will this move make sense? Yeah. So Hamdulillah, I've got a good team. PR yeah. team, media team. I've got an Islamic, uh, you know, I've got a, uh, um, scholars. Actually, I've got a very big scholar on my side. Alhamdulillah, I don't want to mention his name, but Alhamdulillah, he's, he's helped me. Um, yeah, legal team, financial team. Alhamdulillah, a lot of brothers have helped me. <clears throat> I, I can't mention them all. They've, they've been fantastic. Did, did they come as a result of reaching out to you or did you reach out to them to form that team? The only reason I ask that question is because there's a lot of people, bro, like that in that situation, yeah. that are losing their job in civil service. Yeah. You know, in the medical, they're not as well known as you, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. they don't have that leverage of a network. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you give to them, bro? Yeah. So for me, Alhamdulillah, all of them reached out to me. All of them, Alhamdulillah. Okay. So they, they, literally every single one reached out to me because I had that network anyway. Yeah. Uh, for like people like you know, if you work at Primark or coffee shop or civil service, whatever the case may be, and you don't have a media profile then I would reach out, definitely, you know, can, can reach out to me, LinkedIn, you know, I will help you as well, because it's only right that, that I, I help people as well, so reach out to me. Um, don't always reply to my DMs, I'm very, very busy, but there are, there are campaign groups, there's um, this Cage, there's Mend, there's, there's Tell Mama, there's, uh, you know, I think what I'll do after the podcast, I'll send yeah. you some links. Just put, okay. just put them in the description. description. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's there better. you go, guys. We're gonna put a link in the description. Check it out in case you're going through something similar, and we will take it from there. But yeah, and, and you got a lot of love and support from the community as well, man. Yeah. Do you know what I mean, your hair is a bit of a hero, man. <laughs> do you know, what I mean? Alhamdulillah, the love, the outpouring of love, the duas. I was in London two weeks ago, met Achi Ayman and Ahmed Yaqub, mashallah, brothers, and all their circle, showing massive support huge amounts of love, outpouring of dua, people messaging me that I can't reply to, by the way, so many messages that like, you know, you're in my duas, we are, you know, we are so grateful that you st stood up for what is right, yeah. you're on the right side of history, and that for me, wallahi, I took a short term loss, but wallahi, I've gained long term. SubhanAllah, man, what a beautiful statement to make, man, Thank honestly, you. and we'll end it on this particular question, right, so I think this shows the importance, right, and we talked about this in our initial conversation on the phone, mm -hmm. the importance of like having, you know, our community having our own establishments, our yes, own businesses, yes, yeah. get our money up, man, and I think, you know, your tagline on YouTube is helping men master mindset. Muscle, money. Chase. It's go. a bit like Tyler. Come on, man. <laughs> Brian today for a better tomorrow. We should exactly. do a collab in some ways, man. Yeah, definitely. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, that, that shows we have to, in some ways, escape the matrix. Yeah. So we're not at the mercy of this. Do you know what I mean? There's actually some two brothers from Sweden who have launched Palestine Cola. You might have seen it, you know, two or three days ago. We used to have Kibla Cola, Ramak Kibla Cola, Black Seed Cola. Yeah. We should have our own businesses. Yeah. We should have our own ventures, startups. We should have our own economy, right? Yeah. We should do, like I yeah. said to you on the phone. In the 1930s, there was a Black Wall Street in Harlem. The, the, there was still civil rights go movements going on and the blacks in America still li lived under an apartheid state, right? They couldn't yeah. go on the buses at the same time as the whites. So they created their own, own economy and it was thriving and it was recession proof because we don't deal in interest. We, we don't deal in usury. So why can't we create our own alternative economy, which could be decentralized, mm. but we've got enough wealth in the Middle East to fund businesses. Yeah. If you look at, uh, uh, I, th I don't know his first name, but Rothschild had five children 
and he sent each of them to city in Vienna, London, Munich, Berlin, I think. He sent each of them Paris. To form banks, right? For form banks. Yeah. We should have something similar. Yeah. For Muslims who, that don't deal in usury, mm. that fund Muslim business and startups. What a dream, man! You know, so uh, creating an alternative economy, which will benefit the entire world. I went to Islam Channel two weeks ago. You know, Alhamdulillah, they've got non-Muslims working for them, and that's a dawah as well. Yeah. If you've got a Muslim business. Predominantly Muslim workers, but 20% are non-Muslims. You give indirect dawah just through your actions, through your making salah, making wudu. Everything, you know, is non-usury based. Everything is pure because Islam is all about purity. Uh, I say Islam is about two things, purity and sabr. Mm. But the purity must come before sabr because the purity is about purity of intention. Islam is about sexual purity, mental purity, physical purity. Purity in every single sense and financial purity, right? No, yeah. no usury. Yeah, yeah. So if you can understand... Purity, that's what Islam's about. Purity and sabr. And purity of intention as well. Not having any invested interest or, you know, kind of, you know, kind of not getting won over on people. Because Islam's about accountability at the end. Because you're going to go to Allah SWT at the end of the day. So we should create, we've got enough manpower there. Enough e-commerce uh, now. That's a big one. You know, exactly. We've got enough power there to create. We saw with the Qatar World Cup. There's yeah. a lot of wealth in the Middle East. And he shortly saw with Russia last year, I think in Dagestan and, 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 and Chechnya, they're creating a non-interest-based banking system. You might have seen the article last mm. year mm. in that part of the part of Russia. We should do that. We should create, it's 100 years, literally this week, of the abolishment of the Khalafa, 100 years, 1924, with right. the fall of the, wow. the Ottomans in 1924 in Turkey. 100 years this year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. this week, 3rd of March, I think it was. 100 years, Khalafa got abolished. So we need a re-establishment of an Islamic system, which will only benefit the world. Yeah, hundred percent, man. And you mentioned macro there, but even on a micro level, like this is one thing I like about the Jewish community, right? Is that they only do business with other Jewish people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that, man. So, for example, if you had two laundries, right, yeah. laundry shops, mm. and one had a Jewish owner mm. and the other one was not a Jewish owner, mm. they will still go to the Jewish one. Yeah, yeah, yeah to make sure that the wealth circulates in the Jewish community. Exactly. And, and, and this is also similar with the Hindu community in, North, in, in London as well. You go to places there where instead of taking a, a, a mortgage, they'll, they'll give each other a loan, interest-free loan, to buy a house. It's not a committee, is it, bro? Don't, it, it might be a committee. Don't tell me it's a committee, bro. No, no, it's, it's, it's a committee. It's a for disaster no, no, right no, no, now. No, it's, it's a committee. <laughs> but essentially, it's helping each other get on the property ladder, business ladder, yeah. without taking out conventional loans. Right. Yeah. Conventional loans dilute your own circulating wealth because they're external. <clears throat> you go to the mainstream. So we talked about, we talked about the matrix. You can't truly escape the matrix if you always go into banks for loans, etc. You've got to keep it in house. That's how you truly escape. And you circulate wealth amongst each other. Pure wealth, by the way, interest free wealth. That's what we need. Yeah, 100%, man. All right, we're going to end it with a few Instagram questions. To be honest, I've answered about seven of them already incorporated into the into the um, the interview so there's only like one or two left right so by the way and in future episodes we'll put our story on instagram or tiktok um at take on my podcast so make sure you guys you know keep a follow on that so you can see or submit your questions basically right so there's only two questions bro because i've already incorporated it but the first one is you say you have beauty brains body and business the four b's but what are good question to be fair but what are some of the things you struggle with on a daily basis that no one knows? That's a good question. And whoever uh, asked that, props to you. I'll, I'll give it justice by thinking about the answer. What I struggle with, okay. I think sometimes coming from a lower soci socioeconomically developed area, Sheffield, inner city Sheffield, sometimes struggle with imposter syndrome. Right, interesting. You know, like, I've got self-belief, of course. But sometimes you think, you know what? What if... What if... Now I get found out, because, you know, I, I am who I am. This is me authentically. This is my genuine self, and I've got integrity. But what if, you know, people don't celebrate authenticity anymore? You've got to be a certain way. So, yeah, in, imposter syndrome, I would say. Not in a massive way, but probably the one thing I struggle with. Because, you know, I, we didn't have much growing up. We didn't have role models in the community. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can make it in sport, yes. There's, there's actually, actually a lot of guys I grew, grew up with that made it. Like Joe Root, Cal Walker, Nassim Hamid, the Sheffield lads, they made it in sport. 
but trying to make it in in academia and business didn't really have many role models growing up in that sense so i'm still trying to find my way in the world of business yeah i wouldn't say i've made it yet yeah so you're until you've made it so to speak you're still going to get that imposter syndrome to say look you're only a, a little kid from sheffield yeah you know so until you climb out of the bucket you, you, you're always going to have a bit of self-doubt a lot of entrepreneurs say that i suffer from that ali Adolf, for example famous doctor as you might know mm -hmm, yeah. he says he can even now yeah. suffers from imposter syndrome so i think that's part of the process to be fair it is yeah yeah um this is a bit of a big question to be honest it's the last question it's probably a topic on its own to be fair and but big up to you for asking the question to be fair um i suffer from porn addiction mm -hmm. what is the starting process for me to overcome this addiction a very good topic and it's a topic which i can help you with so can I plug something? Of course you can. Okay. So if you go to Instagram, uh, Ibn Sina Sanctuary, Ibn Sina Sanctuary. Yeah. Ibn Sina was a famous doctor. Yes. Avishena, they called him. O over there, I give absolutely discounted rates, sometimes even pro bono uh, coaching sessions on, on pornography addiction. Because right. I can't talk about it. Cause each case is different. The extent of it how it's affecting your marriage, how it's affecting your performance at work, etc. So I take on, by the way, 99% of porn addicts are men. 99.9% .9 of porn addicts are men. And a lot of them are married men. So it's, the reason why I talk about men is because the majority are men. So I, and at Ibn Senior Sanctuary, I offer coaching and counseling slash, slash therapy to get you out of pornography addiction. And you can find me there. And these guys, mashallah, are doing a very good job, uh, very good job. Sister Rebecca, alhamdulillah, sh shout out to her, doing a very good job helping brothers brother and sisters overcome addiction, trauma, etc. But I deal with addiction, mainly pornography, with men. So you can find yeah. me there. Absolutely amazing, man. It's a big problem and I'm glad you asked that question. So being brave and because it's a big thing that a lot of people need to address and it's a taboo subject. So, you know, got a great plug there as well. Amazing. So, um, Dr. Asim Munaf, man. Thanks for coming on the podcast, bro. Brother, pleasure. You have a great host. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely amazing having you on, man. Honestly. Um, if you enjoy the podcast, make sure you like and subscribe, share. It helps the channel more than you know. With that being said, we'll see you in the next one. Peace. I want to start a community where we get like-minded individuals to come in where they can collaborate, support each other to be the best version of themselves. In that community, when they join, they get resources. So like how to become healthier, becoming financially wealthy. Only way to do that is through a community of like-minded men, led by men who have been in the trenches, men who have lived that life, men who know slightly more than the average man about mindset, money, fitness, motivation, etc. The value is 10 times what you pay for. It's all about becoming the best version of yourself, tying your camel, grinding today for a better tomorrow, Tomorrow, all of us moving in the same direction. Let's tie our camel this year. So many times we don't know where to turn to. Growing up, we're the same age, right? Grew up in big industrial cities. We didn't have role models. Now we've got role models. It's only right we give back to the community. And we'll do some exclusive podcast content as well. Big, big names coming. Yeah. Sports stars, stars in the media. Yeah. Stars which you, you probably won't even think you can get access to, but we've got access to that. We're gonna do group calls, drop-in sessions, workbooks. It's very intimate. It's a small set and you'll get all that for literally the, the price of a couple of cups of coffee. There's going to be a link where you can register your interest by putting your email address in and once it's ready to launch, we'll notify you guys. Absolutely guys, sign up. I'm all about helping men master mindset, muscle and money. With yourself, we can do that 10x. We'll see you on the other side guys. Peace.